Now I know this is the three millionth video on YouTube about Glocks, but something has happened relatively recently that makes me personally more excited about the Glock platform than any time over the last 40 years. So stick with me and I'll explain it. So the reason that there are three million videos about Glock is because it's actually a very important and influential firearm. You can actually divide uh, modern handguns up into sort of two categories, the before Glocks, uh, when everything was made out of steel and had hammer fired mechanisms and was made a certain way. And the after Glocks is made of largely plastic and is striker fired in nine millimeter and double stack. And, but the internal mechanisms are also pretty different. And that is significant. Now I realize that there's also 3 million Glock videos because people like to pit the tactical Tupperware against the two world wars, all American champion right here. Now, Let's show them some good old-fashioned American swagger. Yeah, I expect that will continue on in the comment section of this very video, but uh, try to keep it a little clean. I hate rude behavior in a man. Won't tolerate it. Also in the comment section, I'm sure some of you are wondering where Kevin Costner is, but this video is actually, well, it belongs to somebody else. Thanks, Doc. You take care of yourself, okay? Well, let's get back to the Glock story, which begins in around 1980. A gentleman named Gaston Glock is an engineer. He's making some stuff in his garage and he has a day job at another factory. And in his garage, he is making curtain rods, he is making entrenching tools, and he's making knives for the Austrian military. And because of these, these last two jobs, where he's actually supplying things to the Austrian military, he happens to overhear a conversation about the Austrian army needing a new service pistol. At the time, they were using this particular P-38. Well, actually not this particular one. This particular one is not Austrian. My favorite movie is The Sound of Music. But they needed a replacement sidearm and Gaston Glock overheard the conversation and asked if he would be allowed to enter a contender in the military trials. And they said, of course. Uh, without really expecting that he would be able to pull it off. Because as nice as his entrenching tools and knives allegedly were, there's a pretty big difference between a knife, which is you know usually one piece of metal and then an injection molded plastic part, and a military sidearm. It's, it's a few more parts usually, it's a little more going on. Not only was Gaston Glock building all of these things in his garage, he had a metal stamping machine and he had a uh, small injection molding machine, he also had very little experience with pistols. And so as soon as he heard about these new military trials, he went out and he bought a few firearms. He bought uh, a Beretta so that he could get some experience with that. He bought a CZ-75. And uh, of course he also bought a P-38 so that he could have some pistol experience, and he started shooting them in his basement. That was step one of his design and research project. And then step two was to get a whole bunch of military guys, because he did not have uh, much military experience. He got them all together in a room and he got together a wish list of things that they would like to see in a military sidearm. And then step three was to build this. Um, I'm kind of not joking. It appears that the process was those three steps. And this is where the legend of Glock kind of begins. There's people on the internet who say, obviously he's a genius engineer to invent something like this essentially from scratch. And then there's other people who say, no, all of the parts of this gun are ideas whose time had come. It was inevitable that people would start doing all of the things that he did. And who's right? Uh, I think both sides are correct. There are a whole bunch of really fascinating technological advancements that had just happened in the early 1980s, late 1970s, and none of Glock's competitors were really capitalizing on those things. But also, it's really hard to picture someone who isn't a really excellent engineer pulling off something like this. 
Now, one of the defining features of the Glock is of course the plastic injection molded frame. And it's important to note that this is not the first plastic gun. Remington had been making plastic stocked rifles uh, since the mid 60s. And then uh, H&K actually tried to make a plastic framed pistol in 1970. It was called the Volks Pistol 70. And uh, it's actually very interesting. We have this idea now, this assumption, which is, you know, supported by all of the facts that says that Heckler & Koch doesn't particularly like civilians. They only want to sell to militaries and they only want to sell high quality fancy stuff. But in 1970, they made the VP-70 specifically to give to the citizenry. And it was a fully automatic pistol with a shoulder brace so that people could defend themselves against Russian invaders. Unfortunately, it wasn't a great pistol, but it definitely proved that you could make a plastic receiver so what Glock did was take a whole bunch of modern technologies, which had been proven, but they just weren't being used by the firearm industry. And he rolled them all into one. So if you compare the Glock with this 1911, you can see that this very complicated metal frame here on the 1911 that has to be machined out of steel by hand or by relatively expensive advanced machines, is a big part of the difficulty and the expense of manufacture. All of that stuff gets made in just a few seconds in an injection molding machine out of a material that costs pennies on the dollar. And there's a bunch of other things that happen when you switch to this material. This is now very, very corrosion resistant. And because it has a little bit of flexibility to it, it's not only lighter, but it absorbs some of the recoil and it takes up any sort of slop in any of your internal components that may not fit absolutely perfectly the way that your precision machine steel parts have to. Changing the material of the frame or the receiver or the lower, whatever you want to call it, does more than just change the manufacturing of that one part. It has some pretty significant ramifications for all of the internals and it allows you to engineer it in a very different way. To illustrate that, uh, I'm gonna try to take apart this 1911, if I can remember how. It's been uh, several years since I've done this last and, uh, oh yeah, I knew I was going the wrong way. If I can just remember where this catch point is here. Okay. Now this is very easy to dissemble, which is why I chose this particular part to look at. This is the slide stop or slide release of the 1911, which has to be very carefully machined out of steel. And so this ends up being a relatively time intensive and expensive part to produce. Even today with machine injected metals and various other things that people do to make these. Now let's look at the exact same part on the Glock and see what differences we might notice. I've done this a little bit more recently, but I'm still not exactly Glock armor. There we go. Kind of forgot which way you have to jiggle this to get it out. This is the Glock slide stop or slide release. And as you can see, it's not milled out of metal. It is punch pressed out of a single piece of sheet steel. This takes a fair amount of time to cut and carefully mill. This can be punched out in seconds and then looks like two or three bending operations. So this is a far cheaper part to manufacture and it really is designed around some of the advantages you get from these different materials. And you might say, well, this carefully milled precision steel part is gonna be stronger than this sheet metal part, which is uh, incredibly filthy. This is coming out of my personal Gen 3 Glock and it is, uh, looking pretty good, I would say. This is a stronger part if you make it out of proper tool steel. And this is a much weaker part that is fairly bendable, but it only has to be strong in one direction because of the way the Glock actually designed this part to go in here. It only needs to be strong in the direction where the part is actually strong. Now for the embarrassingly slow reassembly part. Uh, I don't want to talk about every single part in the Glock, but uh, it actually wouldn't take that long because 
The gun that he delivered to the Austrian military for trials had only 33 or 34 parts in it, which is roughly half of uh, some of the other guns that were being tested. And the military trials went incredibly well. He was able to cream all of the competition in those experiments with his prototype, which was actually technically it was this one. Now the timing was on his side yet again, because technically he didn't need to beat everybody in the competition. Uh, behind the scenes, people had decided that they really, really, really wanted to choose for the Austrian military sidearm, an Austrian manufactured pistol, which means Glock didn't have to beat anybody except for Steyr. Steyr at the time made really good rifles, but their pistol was a complete disaster. But that's a little bit immaterial because his prototype outran every single thing in the competition, and it was the clear and obvious choice, and it was chosen. And then he was able to start manufacturing it, and he had an additional advantage over all of the other manufacturers. Any one of these pistol manufacturers could have begun experimenting with these technologies, except that they already had factories set up to make things the old way, set up to mill parts very carefully and very meticulously, and work inside of metal frames that have a lot of small, delicate parts that have to be really, really carefully put together, sometimes hand fit, using the materials that they've been using for hundreds of years. Any of them could have updated their factories, but the cost of upgrading all of those tools, whoever went first was going to start the avalanche, and it turned out to be Glock. He had the downside of needing to invent this thing from scratch, but he also had the advantage of building the factory around this thing from scratch. And since that factory was really, really good at making these really, really good guns really, really cheaply, Glock wanted to sell those outside of Austria. And that is when the world learned about Gaston Glock's Glock 17. Uh, it has that name because it was the 17th patent he had received. It's actually kind of mind-boggling to me that a weapon that is this comprehensively new and reliable and functional is uh, patent number 17. Not sure how many revisions, but uh, it sprang kind of fully formed into the world in that early 1980s period. And a lot of people in the world kind of went crazy. That punk pulled a Glock 7 on me. You know what that is? It's a porcelain gun made in Germany. Doesn't show up on your airport x-ray machines here and it costs more than you make in a month. You'd be surprised what I make in a month. And that's not just Hollywood doing its normal Hollywood thing of not understanding how guns work. That was a pretty common news story at the time when Glocks were new. Newsweek carried that story. A whole bunch of people were just panicking about this magical plastic gun that escaped all kinds of detection. But why, why the big secret? People are smart. They can handle it. The person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. But after a while, uh, that panic kind of wore off, and people began to look at this thing more carefully, and they realized that this was an extremely comfortable, extremely reliable, extremely high capacity, extremely user-friendly, extremely easy to maintain, and extremely affordable handgun platform, and things changed. Obviously, uh, Hollywood prop houses loved this thing for all the reasons that I mentioned, as well as people who were using it in the real world. You have a backup weapon? Never had the need. Get yourself a Glock. Lose that nickel-plated sissy pistol. It becomes a very common sight in films and in television and uh, the music industry. The music industry loved this thing too, because in addition to all of those qualities, it also rhymes with a bunch of stuff. And so it's in a whole bunch of music, which uh, we'll listen to some of it right now. Uh, yeah, well, let's not listen to it right now. But as this grows in popularity, Gaston Glock is able to benefit from another bit of perfect timing. The early 1980s is a point in which the police force of America is wanting to modernize. A lot of them are still running revolvers, and uh, those that aren't are running things like this Smith & Wesson 
Model 39. It's a very capable gun in the pre-Glock world, steel framed, hammer fired, all the things that every pre-Glock gun has in common. And Smith & Wesson owned a complete and total monopoly on police sales at that point. And that rapidly changed with the appearance of the Glock. I noticed on the boat you finally went with the Glock. Glock 40, just like yours. I sort of want to emulate you and be my mentor and all. <laughs> Not only was there a tremendous uh, profit margin on this thing for Glock, but they were able to undercut uh, every other competitor that they had. And this right here fit perfectly into a lot of cultural changes that were happening in law enforcement at the time. The ideas uh, of modern policing were changing, something that required less training and less maintenance, but actually gave more capability to the officer was a pretty easy sell. These things are so cool. Yeah. They shoot underwater. You can pour sand in them and they'll shoot. Shoot every time. It's a good choice. And so, of course, when Glocks are on the hip of every police officer that you run into, and they're in most of the movies, and they're in most of the TV shows, and they're being talked about in music from all sorts of genres, uh, it's no surprise that this became a very popular weapon for private purchase as well. Now this big cultural shift that is going on is kind of interesting to study. It's so clear and it's so obvious that this gun changes almost everything in the firearm industry at the same time that it changes a lot of stuff in the Hollywood and music and police industries that it's gotten a fair amount of attention from people who are outside of the firearm industry. People have talked about the cultural ramifications of this in kind of interesting ways. And one decent example of this is the book Glock, The Rise of America's Gun by Paul Barrett. And he tries to capture what is this thing that happened? What is the mystique of the Glock? What made it America's gun? The dark glamour of the Glock, you know, went up. The dark glamour. But like a lot of outsider journalists, he does a very good job of capturing the details, but I think that he kind of misses the point because this didn't actually become America's gun. This became the next generation of how firearms are made. This became the next generation of how the entire world makes handguns. It's only America's gun because it is the world's gun. Every firearm manufacturer that used to make a steel-framed hammer-fired gun post-Glock also makes a Glock-style firearm. And again, there is more to the Glock style than just a injection-molded plastic receiver and a striker-fired internal system, but the internals in this are made the way that Glock's internals are made. The coatings on the metals are the same as these coatings. Glock pioneered a whole bunch of technologies, not from scratch, but introduced them to the firearm industry in a way that they were universally adopted. CZ made the classic 75, a classic Browning-style gun. Now they also have a Glock style. The P10, this is the full sized, and it's very nice. Every single manufacturer from the pre Glock era now makes a post Glock era handgun. It isn't that this gun has mystique, the dark glamour. In fact, it's kind of the opposite of that. The value of this gun is the pure utilitarian engineering and manufacturing technology matures here. And thanks to Gaston Glock uh, doing a good enough job that this thing is actually the perfect demo of those technologies, every other firearm manufacturer has a clear path forward. This is the Walther. Uh, and you can see that they're doing what Glock has done using all the technologies and manufacturing capabilities that Glock has to roll out their own guns. It is a sea change in the way that weapons are made, not so much in the larger culture. And Paul Barrett doesn't really fully understand the engineering side. This is mostly about how they sold guns to police departments. And he delves into a lot of the weird Glock company stuff, which 
admittedly, there's there's quite a bit of. Uh, they sold a lot of Glocks to a lot of police departments through kind of dodgy means, uh, like at strip clubs and things, which is, you know, I'm pretty sure that's government acquisition par for the course in the 80s. Um, and there's other parts of the Glock company that read a little bit like an Australian, yes, I said Australian soap opera, things like various embezzlement schemes and some of Glock's own business partners hiring a uh, hitman to come and get him. And he, for some reason, isn't armed with this very handy self-defense weapon and has to battle them with his bare hands and is victorious and goes on to marry uh, much, much younger women inside of his company. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a whole thing. If that's the sort of thing you're looking for, read the book. Everything else, I think, really comes down to the engineering, the manufacture, and then the wider adoption by public. So now let's talk a little bit about the objections or complaints of some of the gun control folks. Because as we've talked about in past videos, there is a lot of concern from people who are worried about firearms about military style firearms. Military grade weapons. Military style assault weapons. Military weapons of war. Are... Military style semi-automatic weapons. Military style assault weapons. That are military style. Military style weapons designed to kill as many people as possible. Now believe it or not, there's not that many guns that were actually designed specifically for militaries. But this was, this was very specifically designed to win a military contract for the Austrian army. And yet, the features that this gun has, its low price point, its high reliability, the fact that it is very easy and simple to shoot, the fact that it is very safe when it comes to its operation, the fact that it can be easily cleaned and upgraded even by someone like myself, this is a really excellent uh, set of attributes for the private civilian gun owner, not just the military. And the idea that law enforcement or military personnel are going to have completely different needs for their service pistols, their self-defense sidearms, than the citizenry, who also are going to have self-defense responsibilities in relatively similar scenarios. And the use of deadly force is authorized in order to save lives. Well, of course it makes sense that uh, they would want the same level of tools. When it comes to the capacity of the weapon, when it comes to the price of the weapon, the reliability of the weapon, the uh, ability to shoot the weapon, they're gonna want the same things. And this third generation uh, handgun technology is what everybody is gonna want. Whether it is made by Glock, uh, whether it is made by Walther, whether it is made by CZ, or whether it is made by other companies specifically building on the Glock model. And that is something that is very, very exciting to me. This is my personal Glock that I purchased uh, at a Texas gun show. It was a police trade-in. It had an awful lot of uh, rounds through it when I bought it. I put an awful lot more rounds through it. It is a Gen 3 Glock, which in my opinion is more or less perfect. Well, obviously it wasn't perfect because I cut the grip off so it would take Glock 19 mags and I changed the sights out. But the Glock Gen 3 gun is pretty amazing as a technology platform. And now that a number of Glock's patents have expired, the Glock has stopped just being a product from a single company, and it has become a platform. We have seen the AR-15 grow in its popularity and its capability when it is a platform. Any manufacturer can make AR-15s or AR-15 parts or invent new ways of doing things on that AR-15 platform. And the Gen 3 Glock has now reached that level of accessibility. So there have been companies for years that have made aftermarket parts for Glocks. It is the undisputed market leader. It has market dominance in a way that Smith & Wesson did 40 years ago. And because of that, every holster maker, like T-Rex Arms, makes a Glock holster. Every slide manufacturer makes a Glock slide. There are companies out there that only make Glock parts because it has the widest adoption of any platform. And now there are companies who are making essentially Glocks. This right here is a shadow system. Shadow system, I believe, was one of the first to start essentially building Glock clones this way. So this is, for all intents and purposes, a Glock, a Gen 3 Glock. It looks different, but all of the internal parts could be swapped in and out 
of this Gen 3 Glock. And this right here is a Palmetto Armory Dagger. The exact same design philosophy, even though, uh, you know, the aesthetics are a little bit different. And then this over here is a Polymer 80 lower and a Polymer 80 slide. And again, you can put all the internals from all these guns into these things. And the number of companies that make these internals, that make triggers, that make slide, stop, release, extractor, all the different bits and pieces, uh, there are so many of them. So the options as you are building out a gun, like this Polymer 80 frame allows you to do, are almost limitless. The options if you are doing maintenance on a firearm and you need something to replace a broken extractor are almost limitless as well. There's a lot of reasons to support a decentralized weapon platform as opposed to just a single product. And so that's one of the reasons that I am extremely excited about uh, this development, which isn't to say that I don't still like my actual original Glock. This thing is uh, approximately 20 years old based on the fact that it had uh, Clinton Assault Weapon Ban era mags with it when I bought it and um, the age of the tritium and some other things. But uh, I am excited about a wider decentralized platform. There's another thing that uh, critics of firearms and firearm companies often bring up. When they bring up specific companies in the firearm industry, they often will say, well, this is a company that only cares about money. This is a company that doesn't care about the human cost of their weapons being out on the street. I'd like to thank you all for reminding me why we have the presumption of innocence in the United States of America. And now that I've been in the firearm industry for over 10 years, I actually don't think that that's true of most companies. Most companies actually have more of a mission than just the bottom line. They actually are eager to get really quality tools into the hands of their customers so that their customers can pursue recreational hobbies or the defense of life and limb. They actually want more for their customers uh, than, you know, just their customers' money. And Glock is kind of the exception that proves the rule, especially at the beginning. Gaston Glock did not build this thing because he loved firearms. Uh, he had to go out and get some firearms to shoot in his basement before he even really had a basis for, for working on this thing. He built this thing solely to get uh, the money from a government contract. Now today, Glock is a very large company. It employs a lot of amazing people, people who love shooting, people who love the idea of self-defense, people who love serving those people who serve others with life-saving equipment. But it is true that Glock is a little bit, um, not a soulless company, but I would say a little bit less, has a little bit less of a mission than some of the others. And so when I see a company like Palmetto State Armory building on the technology of Glock manufacturing, building on this new platform that is available and extending it and making it more accessible to more people at a lower price and really trying to squeeze every last bit of efficiency out of the manufacturing technology that we have today and the engineering that Gaston put into this platform here, I find that very exciting. They have a very clear mission to arm people so that they are able to defend themselves. That is really exciting. It's even more exciting to me than this gun that I personally love. And when I see Polymer 80 building lowers uh, that you can buy at 80% completion and finish yourself at home uh, without doing a whole bunch of extra paperwork, that is very exciting to me. And when the ATF very specifically focused on them and tried to get them shut down and they fought back using every legal tool at their disposal, that's very exciting to me as well. So T-Rex Arms is very excited to continue to support the Glock platform. We've been making holsters for the Shadow Systems line for a long time. Uh, we're supporting the PSA daggers. By the time you watch this video, uh, we're going to be supporting the Polymer 80 uh, frames and builds as well. Now it's just a race between whether we can finish that holster line or finish this video first. But we are excited to support these extra platform supporters. Now, not all of them. This is actually a very cool thing. We can't commit to supporting everybody that makes a Glock clone because the beauty of this decentralized platform is it's almost limitless. Uh, Lone Wolf just announced that they are making a Glock clone. The number of people who will be pumping out Gen 3 compatible Glock clones is gonna be through the roof. So I 
I can't actually commit to making holsters for every single one of them, but uh, we are very excited about the platform and we are going to be working to support it moving forwards, especially uh, the ones that we have just mentioned. Guys who really pushed the envelope of expanding the platform and had very specific missions that they wanted uh, to achieve. And that's Again, very exciting to me. As much as I love the story of Glock and the engineering that went into it and uh, all the different parts of this, this particular puzzle and then obviously, you know, my, my personal emotional attachment to this particular gun that I've carried for a very long time, the mission that is represented by some of these other companies and the opportunity of the platform, that is extremely exciting. That is the thing that I'm gonna keep watching for and you should keep watching for it too. So this uh, Gen 1 Glock 17 is actually a reproduction. We don't have a gun quite that old. Most of these guns, uh, they're, they're historic firearms, but they're actually not quite old enough uh, to be from the right era, except for this one. This one is uh, too old. And this uh, classic P38 leather flap holster has an even more interesting story than the firearm. But we'll, uh, we'll get to that some other day.